Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. We have a year end update with Millennial Precious Metals. They listed earlier this year on the TSXB with the ticker MPM and recently listed on the OTC QB. So looking forward to getting an update and hearing what the company's got planned for 2022. Uh, as always, this presentation will contain forward-looking statements. If you'd like to know more about those, you can find them on the company's presentation on their website. And there will be a Q&A section at the end, so feel free to input your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. With that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Jason Kosek, CEO. Hi, Jason. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, Deb. Thanks for having us, and uh, thanks to all your uh, listeners out there. Yeah, great. So uh, I think you're going to give us a quick overview of the company. I would encourage anyone that's new to Millennial to check out some of the previous webinars. Uh, and then I think you're going to give us a little overview of last year and upcoming year, correct? Yeah, correct. I'll give you a brief summary of the company, see what we've done over the 2021 season, get into the some of the assets on a very high level. So if anyone wants to ask questions later on in the presentation, uh, feel free to put them into the, the chat window. And then really show you what's going to drive the, the value creation in 2022. Sounds good. You know, as Deb mentioned, we will be making some forward-looking statements. So for a detailed disclaimer, just check out our website. What we're really doing here at Millennial is building a multi-million ounce, multi-asset production company. And what we're really focusing on is near-surface, heap leachable ounces in Nevada. And why we're doing that is that the cost for discoverable ounce is extremely low. Um, and the cost to put this into production is extremely low. And the margins that you can make off these projects is quite high. Um, we also looked at when we were looking at all these assets is all of these, well, the key ones, Mountain View and Wildcat have you know, clear visibility to a million ounces of oxide uh, that will really drive the economics. Um, in a summary, what you really get is, is a diversified portfolio uh, in, in the top mining jurisdiction in the world. With, with our development stage assets, Wildcat and Mountain View, you can think of them as, as one combined project because of their proximity to one another. Uh, it'll have, they'll have a combined resource and a PEA in, in 2022. You get a really exciting uh, drill bit story, uh, Red Canyon, that we've put out results uh, earlier this year. It's hosted on the Battle Mountain Eureka Trend, 35 kilometers south of the Cortez, Cortez complex. It sits in the same rock types, the Wenban Formation, which is one of the most productive horizons in, in Nevada. And it sits on the same fault system. And what's key is that the, the, the intrusive rocks are the same age uh, as, as all the Carlin style systems. Um, what we won't talk about today is Dune, Eden, Mar, and Oslo. There are phase one uh, target uh, generation projects that really give us a nice pipeline of growth. Uh, quite ex aggressive drill program of 20,000 meters, the brunt of it across Mountain View, Wildcat, and a little bit uh, at Red Canyon. You have a current resource base of 1.2 million ounces. That's combined at Wildcat and Mountain View. We'll get, we'll get into to the projects later on in, in the breakdown. Uh, you have a strong cash balance uh, right now of over $16 million. So the drill program, the PEA, the updated resource, and everything that we're going to talk about today is fully funded for 2022. And I think the key metric uh, to these to the management team is the discovery of over 59 million ounces. And I know everyone talks about that, but uh, the key metric, as I mentioned, is it's across seven projects, five of which are in construction or in production today. Um, we don't need to get into the team. We, we, if anyone wants to, to talk about that, we can, we can address it later on in the presentation. But what I wanna talk about right now is, is what we've achieved in 2021. And I think it's one of the most aggressive programs uh, in the junior mining space. And as, as most people know, what can kill junior companies is time. And we've expedited and been uh, very aggressive with our 2021 season with two resource updates, Mountain View and Wildcat, did a $24 million go public financing, uh, straight common, no warrant, done at 50 cents. Went public on the TSX Venture through a three-way amalgamation and acquired seven properties during that program. Uh, 20, 000, initiated a 20,000 meter drill program, added key members to, to, our, to our leadership team. Uh, and then the second half, we acquired both permits, all, all permits for Red Canyon, Wildcat, and Mountain View. 
we had drilling results coming from 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 Red Canyon. Had drill results coming from Mountain View. We acquired the Oslo Zeno properties. We acquired the Sierra Colorado properties, uh, and then went uh, uh, went public on the OTCQB. So very aggressive 2021 season, uh, as you can see. Uh, quickly from a share structure point. Of Point of view, where you know we're sitting right now, pretty tight float at 138 million. Um, I think one of the things that sets us apart from any other junior company in the space is our share roster. Um, you commonly don't see these names in companies sub 100 million dollar market cap from the likes of Merck, Eric Sprott, Vescor, uh, Nugent, Franklin Templeton. Century. These are all companies that you know never come down to sub $100 million market cap. And I think that speaks miles to the track record uh, of, of our team. One thing I want to mention is, is the six of the properties came from Waterton. Uh, part of the transaction is, is they got 99 pro forma at the RTO. As you can see, uh, they sit at 9.7%. Uh, we've been working uh, very well with Waterton. Uh, you know, it was always their strategy to to monetize that that position. Uh, th that was their strategy from day one. We've been very proactive um, with placing those blocks so it wouldn't affect uh, th the share price in the market. Uh, and, the, and the stock went to Franklin Templeton, which is one of the biggest gold funds in North America. Uh, Kevin Bambro, who's a high net worth guy in, in, in Toronto, uh, and a little bit went to, to, to Vescor. So just so everyone knows, it was perceived as an artificial overhang. Uh, that was never the case. We've always worked well with Waterton. Uh, and the next, so there's no stock that's available from Waterton right now. The next block comes up uh, in May uh, 2022. It was actually May 28th. Uh, where another 4.9% comes up. And then in November, 2022, the remainder comes up. So it's locked up right now uh, under the escrow agreements with, with the TSX venture. Uh, as, we, as we grow and as we grow our street presence, uh, we've had eight capital and Stiefel initiate uh, coverage. We will have Sprott, Cormark and PI uh, in, in, in the new year. Um, what they're really modeling is is uh, is a combined uh, project nav of around 400 million after tax at at seven percent using 1650 the gold price. So they're using you know around 100 million dollar capex, two dollars a ton mining, four processing, two GNA, and then using a 60 percent nav multiple to, to to get their target price. Uh, I think it's important just to touch on this. Uh, as we're going through the, the plan of operations permit and, and into the mine permit, really thinking about tomorrow, today, and going above and beyond from a social, environmental, and a, and a governance perspective. And we will be putting out annual ESG reports. Um, I'm not going to get too deep into the assets. Uh, if people have questions, uh, we, we can talk about it later on in the presentation uh, when, when, when everyone has questions. Right now, just so you know, these are pit constrained oxide ounces only. We're using a $1,500 pit shell and we're currently sitting at 776,000 ounces at no strip. And that is the key metric that I'll get on later into the presentation. Um, the program will start in the spring of 2022. Uh, so it's a major catalyst uh, for, for next year. It's focused on identifying the plumbing system, seeing where we can expand the resource, seeing what the resource conversion rate is. It's just over 4,000 uh, meters. Um, we've Right now, what we've done is we've done a detailed mapping program and identified a lot of key targets that sit within, within, the, within the district. One of the big things we've noticed is through the historical data compilation, there's a big gap here uh, and a big gap here. And, and what that is, is there's post-mineral basalts that, cover, that are covering the mineralizing horizon. Right below that, there's historical drill data uh, that are very indicative of, you know, 50 to 100 meters of 0.2 to 0.5 oxide material. Uh, so when you really look at the entire footprint at Wildcat, you're looking at 2.3 kilometers by 1.2 kilometers 
by 150 meters of, of oxidation, you know, conservatively, you know, you could use 2.7 for density uh, and say 60% of that is mineralized, which is very conservative. You're looking at over 220 million tons of ore, and we currently sit at 62 million tons. Now, that being said, uh, we'll need the plan of operations to, to, to drill out the, the, the entire footprint. Uh, so don't be expecting, you know, that type of tonnage in the next resource. Uh, we have clear visibility uh, over a million ounces of oxide. I'm not going to talk about any of the transition or, or the sulfide material as we need to do more metallurgical work. Right now, the current resource is basically that red line and above. There's plenty of gaps uh, that are basically relics of lack of drilling uh, that could be infilled and, and add additional tonnage. One of the key things people neglect to realize is that in Nevada, a lot of the, the projects when they're quoting global resources, a lot of the sulfide mineralization is refractory. And why that's significant is you need an autoclave to, to process that material. And the processing cost is a lot higher and the lineup to get an autoclave is about 10 years down the road, okay? So these are all oxides. So they have superb leach kinetics around 83 to 85% on the oxides. And on the sulfides, the sulfides leach around 35 to 55%. So the margin when you're when you're looking at this thing, you're just basically digging it up, throwing on a pad, sprinkling cyanide, and catching the the pregnant solution, and then put it through a, a stripping facility. So from a cost perspective, you're looking at two dollars a ton mining, four processing, two GNA, and the the in situ value for for, for the metal in the ground is around thirty dollars a ton. And our operating costs are eight. So this is a high margin business, okay? I'm going to get into Mountain View. Again, these are pit constrained ounces, oxide only. We're only using a $1,500 pit shell. Uh, you're sitting at 0 0.57 and 427,000 ounces currently. Um, the program was designed to identify the plumbing system, which we did. You know, I'm talking almost a meter of 141 grams. That's what feeds these things. So think about low sulfidation as a mushroom. Uh, the fluid migrates up ver vertically, hits a more permeable cap, and then you get this disseminated zone with the higher grades sitting below it. I'll get into a diagram uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, we also needed to see what the resource conversion rate was. We needed to test all the areas of the block model to do metallurgical work. It was 30 holes, 7,200 meters. It is currently ongoing. Uh, what we've noticed is the grade is, is higher than expected in the block model. We've identified the feeder zone, which I mentioned, you know, 0.8 of 141 grams. Uh, the sand and gravel that sits on top is, is really the pre-strip. So it's not a real pre-strip. It's so it won't be conventional drill and blast where you're looking at $2 a ton. It'll be closer to a dollar because you just use a dozer and a hoe to dig it out. The oxidation profile, we're looking at 250 to 300 meters. What we've also noticed is that, you know, as I mentioned, these are pit constrained ounces. So everything in that red line and above, all of this material that sits below it is not in the current resource. What we've noticed is the grade gets higher at, at depth and into the basin. You know, when I'm talking with 20 meters of 2.3, so, you know, I've done a lot of resource estimation in my life. So when you run a, a new whittle shell with a higher grade, and better economics, you could start to bring in all the higher grade blocks that sit below the current pit shell, like that red line I just, just drew. Um, very consistent mineralization here. I'm talking, you know, 128 meters of 1.7 grams. To put that into perspective for everyone of oxide, the average grade of the Great Basin is around 0.32, okay? That, that, so it's very important that people understand that there's a significant difference between oxide mineralization and sulfide, and then sulfide mineralization that is refractory, okay? Um, here's a summary of, of you know, all, of, all of the holes. You know, some of the things I love the most is 
the consistency of the mineralization. You know, I'm talking 275 meters of 0.49, 164 meters of 0.32. So what I'm talking about is, you know, at 0.32, you're looking at $22 a ton in situ value, where our mining costs are $8. So high margin business. Uh, also, you know, holes are going anywhere from 94 meters past the pit shell to 25 meters past the pit shell. So expanding the, the pit shell uh, at depth as, as we proceed. Well, we've also noticed that the way these things form is they're controlled by these major fault systems. They're called range front faults. So the fluid uses that as, as a conduit. We know that there's historical little pits and adits that sit in the foot wall. And where these form is where you have these inflection points or these dilational jogs. So right now we're only looking at the severance pit right there. And there's two other dilational jogs. So the plausibility of having more mineralized centers along this range front fault is, is highly probable. And it's very common to see this in the Sierra Massif and the Sierra Madre. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned to you, you know, Wildcat and, and Mountain View form the, the same, same, same ways. Fluids migrate up this a fault, hit a more permeable horizon, which is the cap of the mushroom, so to speak. You get a nice disseminated open pit oxide project. And where the veins form is commonly in the andesite. Uh, again, Sierra Massif, Sierra Madre, you see this all the time. And that's where these bonanza zones are coming from. The, you know, the meter, almost a meter of 141 gram type of material. So from a production scenario, you get a beautiful oxide open pit, and then they commonly go into a very high grade underground project. Uh, an example would be a sleeper in Nevada. Uh, Red Canyon, we drilled earlier this year, 12 holes, 2,300 meters. Some of the most significant intercepts I've seen to date in Nevada. Uh, I just wanted to touch on it. Uh, we, we, we've touched on it in previous webinars, but you know, 22 meters to 54 meters of 0.5 to four and a half gram oxide from surface. So 54 meters of four and a half gram oxide will be one of the better intercepts I've seen in Nevada to date. Uh, we put it out in April, so I don't think anyone really recognized it uh, as we were just trading for, for a month there. As I mentioned, this sits in the same rocks as Cortez, Gold Rush, uh, pipeline, Horse Canyon, sits on the same fault system. The age of the mineralization is the peak mineralizing event in Nevada, which is 35.5 MA. Uh, so all the key signatures to host massive Carlin style systems, Red Canyon checks the box. I'm not going to go through the, the entire checklist, but that's as a geologist, uh, as an exploration guy, that's what gets me really excited. It, it, it could be something world-class. We won't know until later next year. What I want to drive home to everyone here is, is how everyone should look at open pit projects is you need to do the grade divided by the strip to get the effective grade of the deposit. This is how when Barrick looks at things or Kinross looks at things, this is what they do. So you do the grade divided by the strip and that gets your effective grade. So that's what drives your economics, okay? Um, and when you do that, Millennial has the highest effective open pit oxide project in Nevada. Everyone thinks GSV is high grade at 0.86. And remember, these are oxides. When you factor in the effective grade, it actually sits at 0.28. One of the things too is Hasbrook is, you know, 70% owned by Sun Valley, but, you know, Northern Bullfrog, Pan, uh, Gold Rock, Mother Load, have all been involved in recent transactions. So really, you know, from, a, from an oxide perspective in the top mine jurisdiction, the only things, the projects that are left are Millennial and GSV, and GSV is a $200 million company. Okay, just to put that into perspective for everyone. And really what, what's gonna drive that is, is once we put out our PEA in the, in the fourth quarter of 2022, you'll see a significant re-rating to trade in line with our peer group. You know, the, the average in, in Nevada for, for oxides is around $52, $55. 
And we're currently actually, it's a little bit outdated. We're currently tra trading at 36. Um, it should be noted, you know, these are on global ounces, okay? So, you know, GSV is only 1.2 million ounces of oxide and the refresh, the refresh, the rest is refractory. So you can basically discount the 1.7. So they'd be closer to trading uh, uh, at, at around $90, $90 an ounce. Uh, like I said, Integra has, has sulfides in there. Uh, this is just oxides. We have clear visibility to a million and a half, between a million and a half to 2 million ounces of oxide in, in the next resource update. Again, the transition could play a significant contributor past, past the one and a half. I don't want to talk about that and, and speculate on that as I need to see more metallurgical work done. But as I mentioned earlier, the sulfides, which contribute the transition zone material, have really good leach kinetics and they are not refractory. Okay, so really seeing this trade in line with our peer group over the next really 18 months where in the Liberties, the Integras, the GSVs, uh, which are around 200 to $250 million Canadian companies. Really what's gonna drive the story uh, in the 2022 season is continued results every month from Mountain View, then results from Wildcat, the initial network, the updated resource in the third quarter, uh, the second phase of drilling uh, in Red Canyon, and then the PEA in the fourth quarter of 2022. So really what you get is a really diversified portfolio of assets and the evaluation is underpinned by the current ounces. Not only do you get a significant re-rating opportunity off those ounces, um, you also get a lot of blue sky and free carry uh, with the addition of, of more ounces and the whole entire exploration portfolio. You have myself as, as the, one of the largest shareholders other than Eric Sprott. I've put over a half a million dollars of my own money into this company. Uh, I've been consistently buying in the market with uh, other people, other people in, in management like Jason Banducci. So we're significantly aligned with our shareholders uh, and really a, a share roster that you would not see in, in any other you know, junior company sub $100 million market cap. Uh, and with that, Deb, that's that's really all I got, and I'll I'll open it up for for questions now. Thanks for that overview, uh, Jason. So, just talking about your drill programs for next year, and I apologize if I missed it. Have you uh, determined how many meters you're planning on drilling at each of the projects? So, Wildcat is just over four thousand meters. It's forty one hundred meters, um, and Mountain View is just over twenty seven hundred meters. Uh, and Red Canyon is 1,500 meters. Okay, and those updated resources that you're putting out um, on those two projects, uh, how many meters of drilling will be included in those updates? All, all of it. So it'll be, it'll be all 4,100 meters from Wildcat and all 7,200 meters from, from, from Mountain View. I think, you know, just so everyone knows, one other reason why we select these types of projects, these low sulfidation epithermals, is the cost per discoverable ounce is extremely low. So commonly in orogenic systems, uh, for a million ounces of inferred is going to cost you $40 million. So you got to take on that dilution as a junior company. Whereas in these low sulfidation epithermals, we could drill off a million ounces for around five to seven million bucks. And you're funded through to the end of next year, I believe? Correct. With your plans. I guess overall strategy, you have a number of projects that you're not currently working on. Are you looking at doing baseline work on those and getting them ready to drill? Are you looking for partners on them? Are you looking for more assets? Maybe you can talk a little bit about your overall strategy. Yeah, the, you know, the strategy of the company is, is, is really to get Wildcat and Mountain View into the permitting process, get it into production as soon as humanly possible. And while we're doing that, you know, only about 10% of the budget is going into kind of our phase one target generation work. So all of the, all of it, really the exploration assets like Red Canyon, Dune, Eden, Mar, and Oslo. So that once Red Canyon goes through a resource stage, one of the four, one of the five exploration assets goes to 
to a drill stage. So we always have that, that, that nice pipeline of, of organic growth. And do you think you'll always stay in the state of Nevada? Actually, you have a project in Arizona. We, we have, we, we just got a project in Arizona, Sierra, Colorado, which is a high grade silver project, uh, which we, you know, we don't even really talk about that. It's, uh, you know, multi kilo silver right on surface. It's a historical silver district. Um, and then in the valleys, it sits in the copper porphyry belt uh, right beside BHP uh, and Hot Bay in Arizona. You know, we, uh, Deb, we've looked at, we did over 337 desktop reviews when we were building this company, followed by 47 site visits, uh, you know, looking at assets in Utah, Idaho, uh, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, avoiding Wyoming, Montana, California for permitting reasons. Uh, so we will go elsewhere, but I think, uh, you know, it's got to be something very creative for, for our shareholders for us to act on it because we've, we've pretty much looked at everything that, that was available okay. in the Great Basin. And can you talk a little bit about permitting in Nevada and maybe some of your ESG programs? Sure. So from, from an exploration permitting perspective, what you do is you start off with an NOI, so your notice of intent. And that gives you five acres of disturbance. And commonly to get those, it's, it's about three months, three weeks, sorry. Uh, and then from that, you do a plan of operations permit for, for exploration. And that takes about 12 to 18 months and it costs around a million dollars. What we do when we start that plan of operations permit for exploration is we basically permit the entire property so we can start doing all of the baseline work. Uh, for the actual plan of operations for the for the mine development permit and the EIS permit. Uh, and while we're doing all that, we actively engage with all of our stakeholders and in, uh, in, in all the communities that we work on to building a strong partnership right from day one. So, you know, you know, sponsoring art programs and daycares um, are, are, are some of the, the, the things we do and in, in planting extra sagebrush so so we get those credits from, from our disturbance as well. Is the sagebrush brush, is that for the grouse? Yes. Can you tell me about that? So, so you basically what a lot of people do is they could buy credits and they buy it from basically ranchers. So they buy the credits when they disturb them. But we've taken a proactive approach where we where we have an environmental team next year actively going out and, and planting it so we can build our own credits. Okay. And so the sage grouse are protected, but only certain times of the year. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. Interesting. I never heard of this kind of bird before, but apparently it's a it's big basically deal. like a it's like a grouse, like in, in Canada. A but just certain yeah, times yeah. Of the year you can't hunt them and they're yeah, exactly. protected. Right? Exactly. Okay. exactly. Okay. Are there any other protected wildlife in the area? Not where not where we are, no. Um, and this all sits on BLM land. Uh, there's no forestry. There's all of the kind of the major roadblocks, uh, like forestry, protected forests you know, raptors, burrowing owls um, are, aren't present. That being said, we are doing our, our we're, we are starting our baseline EA work uh, in January. Got it. Okay, well, I don't see any audience questions and I don't have any left myself. Maybe Jason, you can just run us through the upcoming catalyst that we can expect in Q1 and Q2 again. And yeah, I guess the only question I have is you've looked at all these different projects. You've come off a couple of pretty big successes in your career. Like what, what do you hope to achieve with Millennial? What gets you so excited about it? Yeah, you know, I, I, I like I said, between my partners and I, Terry and Ruben, we've probably looked at over 5,000 projects when we were with the Osisco group. Uh, what really gets us excited about about these is especially wildcat and mountain view because we've, we've put, the, put the most work into it is is they're basically left uh completely unfinished so 
you know, the potential to, to really significantly grow these things, it, it gets us really excited. Um, but more so is that the, the margin that these assets make really builds mining companies. You know, you're, you're, like I mentioned to you, you know, you're all in sustaining costs for these types of things is, is around 800, 850 bucks. And the CapEx is, you know, for something that's going to spit out over 100,000 ounces per annum is around 100 million bucks. So, you know, these are company making assets that get me really excited uh, to build a real, real company. Uh, and then the beauty is, is that we have all these really exciting exploration stories uh, that have never been really looked at. Uh, what we realize when we're doing a lot of work in the Great Basin is a lot of people's models and a lot of the properties that were available and a lot of the projects that people go after are on these main trends like the Battle Mountain Eureka, the Carlin, the Getchell. Um, and the, the problem is, is that their exploration model is, is because the upper plate is, is altered, they're thinking that the, what, the lower plate is going to be mineralized. So they drill through the upper plate in, in hopes to hit the lower plate that's mineralized. And that's exactly how junior companies go broke. Um, and the reality is, is that the projects that where the lower plate comes to surface, a lot of them have been found. And we're lucky we have one of those where Red Canyon, the lower plate is right at surface. But where I think a lot of major discoveries are going to be made uh, in the Great Basin is in the basin itself. Uh, in these in these rift basins where you get these low sulfidation epi, epithermals forming, just like you know Del Mar that uh, Integra has, which is a beautiful project. Uh, you know Mountain View, Wildcat, Dune, Eden Mar, and Oslo are, are are analogous to to projects like that. They're very the same age of mineralization, part of the same rifting event. So I think that's where a lot of new discoveries are going to happen. So I think. You know, Mountain View and Wildcat are the are the company builders, but we have a really nice kind of organic uh, pipeline of growth. Um, and and then really from a catalyst perspective, it's heavy. It's a it's really a drill bit story for the for the first half of 2022, followed by the resource update in the third quarter, and really to wrap it up with a with 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 a pretty little bow to show how robust these projects are is is the PEA uh, early fourth quarter. Got it. Well, it sounds like 2022 will be another exciting year for the company. Um, and I'm looking forward to those catalysts. And like we were talking about before we started the call, there's a lot of M&A happening, which I think benefits everyone. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on your view on that. Yeah, I think you're, I think, you know, the M&A that you commonly see at the start of these bull markets is, is, has been initiated. And, and, you know, things like Kinross and Great Bear, you know, it really gets people excited about, about companies like, like Millennial. You know, the, everyone can speculate uh, on ounces, but you're looking, you know, anywhere from $150 to $300 uh, an ounce for, for, for that uh, Great Bear acquisition. And, you know, we're currently sitting at $38 an ounce. So. I think, you know, people coming, coming down cap into these exploration development stories um, that are high margin and, and clear visibility to a permit are the ones that are going to be, be taken off the shelf. As, 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 as I mentioned, you know, when you're looking at this slide, you know, really the, the projects that are left in Nevada are us and GSV and GSV is a $200 million company. So there, there's not, there's not, meant, there's not much inventory on the shelf. Uh, and when one big company starts feeding, the, all, the rest of them kind of get jealous and, and want to start feeding as well. Yeah, plus the uh, flow of funds, right? There's going to be a lot of capital. Exactly. Here looking for other um, similar types of investments. So I think that'll benefit a lot of the juniors in the coming weeks. Jason, I can't think of That's anything true. else to ask you um, other than, you know, I hope you have a wonderful holiday and looking forward to 2022. Um, is there anything you wanted to talk about that I missed? No, I think we, we covered it all, Deb. Thank you very much for, for having me. I wish everyone a, 
a good holiday season and uh, we'll see you all in 2022. Yeah, and we'll actually see each other hopefully. <laughs> exactly. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out and either myself or Jason will get those answered for you. And thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, Jason, for presenting and have a good afternoon. Take care. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.